This morning we're in the um, letter of, of, of James, and we're going to be looking at chapter 2, verse 26 in particular, but I'm going to read verses 14 through 26, and I think you'll find it to be very similar to what we saw in Hebrews chapter 11, as far as the fact that faith, if we have it, saving faith, will make a difference in the way that we live. So let me read for you uh, James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14 through verse 26, and may the Lord add his blessing to this, his word. James writes, what, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body. What use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected and the scripture was fulfilled which says and Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone in the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another by another way for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this morning. Now, you do realize, as I've read this, this was one of the greatest, um, or I should say, uh, one of the most controversial uh, chapters for Luther as he was trying to reconcile the gospel of free grace with what James is saying here, that we're justified not by faith but by works also. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, that's where we want to follow up on what we saw last time as we considered that salvation is by grace through faith alone, but not by a faith which is alone. And um, that's what we'll be looking at this morning. Now, as I mentioned already in our last evangelistic service, we did examine what the Bible says is clearly the gospel. Salvation, your justification, your right standing before God is by God's grace alone. It's something that um, is contrary to what we often, um, well, hear in, in other churches, sadly. You know, in, in, the, in the Christian church, you have just about every, uh, every conceivable idea being expressed. And just as there are those who swing too far one way and who uh, want to say that you have to add works to your salvation, there are those who swing the other way and say that works are entirely unimportant. There are those who actually teach there is something that you must do besides trusting in Jesus Christ to be saved. But we saw that they are terribly wrong, dangerously wrong. To do so is to destroy the gospel. We believe the Bible teaches salvation is by grace alone. And by that we mean, of course, it's a free gift. Paul says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Why do we believe that salvation is by grace alone? Because that is what the Bible teaches. Now, we also believe it because we understand that grace, the definition of grace, what grace really is, and works are mutually exclusive. 
It can't be both because they, by definition, exclude one another. Grace, by definition, is something that is freely given, something that can't be earned, that cannot be worked for. It must be free. To try to earn it is basically to destroy grace. That's why when Paul heard that the Galatians were being circumcised in order to uh, save themselves, in order to be just in God's eyes, because that's what they were being taught by the Judaizers, he warned them that to go down that path would destroy them. He says in Galatians 5, verses 2 through 4, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. You see, grace and works are mutually exclusive. It has to be either a free gift or it has to be earned. It cannot be both. The Lord tells us it is a free gift. Salvation or justification is basically God's declaration that you are not guilty, but you are righteous and you may freely enter into heaven. This is purely by God's free grace, and as we saw, that it might be by grace alone, that it might be a free gift to us, it must be received by faith alone. Faith is the only thing which excludes works. I look away from my righteousness, I look away from the things that I do, and I look to Jesus Christ alone, and I trust Him and His works. That is the furthest thing from looking to my works to save me. I don't even look to that faith to save me. I look to Jesus Christ. That's what saving faith is. So to summarize that point simply, Jesus did it all. We do nothing. Therefore, he gets all the credit for our salvation, and we get none. Now, this morning we're going to examine uh, the, the opposite heresy. You know, just as it destroys the gospel to add works to our justification, so it also destroys the gospel to say that we can be saved by a faith that doesn't change our lives in some way, that doesn't produce works. And by the way, both of these beliefs, that I need to add works to my justification in order to be right with God, or that I can be saved by a faith that produces no change of life, both of those views are heretical. They destroy the gospel. If you believe them, you will die. You must believe the truth. Now, in this case, the belief is that since your justification, as we've just seen, your salvation is purely by God's grace. It's a free gift. And works are not involved. Works must be pushed entirely out of the picture. To say that you must obey the Lord Jesus Christ in any sense, if you use the word must, I mean, they, they allow it as an option, thankfully. You may. But must? No, if you say must, if you say the works have to be there to enter into heaven at last, then you're a legalist. You believe in works salvation. You have destroyed the gospel. Now, are there people out there who believe this? You better believe there are. I went to a college where the professors uniformly believed that. That's what they believed. And the students believed what the teachers or the professors were teaching them. Um, it was during the time of the MacArthur controversy, what we call the uh, Lordship Salvation. You have to submit to Jesus as Lord if he is to be your Savior. That is what the Bible teaches. But they, that college, considered it to be heretical. And most of the people you would hear on the radio who are seeking to uh, explain the gospel were saying exactly the same thing. That if you say you must do something, in order to arrive in heaven at last, you've destroyed the gospel. Well, that is not true. James tells us faith without works is dead. So over against this, we must stress just as strongly that though salvation is by grace through faith alone, we are not saved by a faith that is alone. True saving faith 
will always be accompanied by works. If it isn't, then it is a dead faith that cannot save us. James tells us faith without works is dead. I should also mention this because um, those that are very much of what we call the easy believism and the anti-lordship position, right? They, they know that James is here. They have to do something with what James says here. And in one debate between John MacArthur and a very prominent, um, uh, I think he was the president of a, a theological seminary, as well as a professor of another theological seminary who was also present, who didn't exactly uh, hold to the same position, the one man argued against MacArthur that dead faith is saving faith. And I hope you can see that that is not the case. James is warning us against this because if we have a dead faith, we will perish. We will have the same kind of faith the demons have. The demons believe and they tremble, but they're not producing the kinds of works that God says must be in our lives if we are to be saved. They don't produce the fruits of faith because they don't have faith. They don't have this saving faith. They don't have a living faith. They have an intellectual faith. And your faith needs to go beyond that to actually producing a change in your life if you are genuinely saved. So let's look at two things this morning. First of all, what kinds of works is James telling us must accompany faith? And then secondly, how the idea that these works must accompany faith is consistent with justification by grace through faith alone. We want to make sure that we don't destroy the gospel in the process of trying to understand these things. So first of all, what kinds of, of works is James telling us must accompany a living and saving faith? If I were to summarize what he's talking about here, I would do it in this way. He tells us there must be works of love, love and trust in the Lord. First of all, there has to be the kind of love that reaches out to a neighbor, that does something to meet his or her needs if they happen to be in need. James writes in verses 15 through 17, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Now, I do want you to see what this says and what it doesn't say. It is talking about seeing a brother or sister that is in need. When Jesus, on the, uh, the day of his judgment, the sheep and goat judgment, is judging the works, he says, inasmuch as you've done it or not done it to one of the least of these brothers of mine, you have either done it or not done it to me. Now, he's not talking about the world in general. He is talking about brethren. I want you to know, secondly, that these brothers and sisters are in need of daily food. They don't have enough food to sustain them. And they don't have clothing, the clothing they need to keep them warm. And you just simply say something to them. Well I, well, I hope you find what you're looking for. Go in peace, and I hope that the Lord warms you and fills you. But you don't do anything to meet that need when you can do something to meet that need. James says, what use is that? The kind of works, the kind of action that saving faith produces goes beyond just well-wishing. I hope you know, things work out for you. It goes beyond praying for them. If you have the need actually to help them, it, it's more than just entering into you know, you know, sort of a sympathetic situation where you're feeling their pain because of the particular plight they're going through. It is a love that actually moves you to do what Jesus Christ commands. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And if you think, if you were in their situation, that you would want somebody to say, be warm and be filled and go your way, be happy, then, all right, go ahead and do that. But if that's not the way you would want to be loved if you're in that situation, if you were to love your neighbor as yourself, then you need to do something to reach out and meet that need. That is what living faith will do. It will produce a Christ-likeness, which means that you will seek to reach out to that need the way your Savior would. 
Now he's talking secondly about a love that is willing to make the greatest sacrifices possible for God. The Lord told Abraham to take his son, his only son, and offer him as a burnt offering. This was the son of promise, as we already saw in Hebrews chapter 11, the one that Abraham had been promised for many years. He had been waiting for his whole life, and now in his old age, the Lord had finally fulfilled that promise. The one through whom all the promises God had made to Abraham were going to be fulfilled through. This was the child of promise. Very, very special to Abraham. God put his finger on that son, and he said to Abraham, let him go. He said more than that. I want you to kill him as a sacrifice and burn his body into ashes. That's what a burnt offering is. And you know that Abraham didn't even ask the Lord why. He just went and did it. Now, he was willing to do this because he loved God. He loved the Lord more than anyone else, more than anything else. And that love moved him to do whatever God would ask him. He did this because he also trusted God. He knew that God would never ask him to do anything that ultimately would not work out for his well-being in the end. And he also knew that God was true to his promises. He knew that God had said through Isaac, your offspring are going to be named, which means that his promise was going to be fulfilled through Isaac. The fact is Isaac had not yet married. He had not yet had any children. And Abraham believed that God had to fulfill that promise because God had promised it. So he knew that even if he killed Isaac, and even if he burned his body into ashes, that God would be able to raise him up again. I mean, not just a dead body, but would be able to recompose ashes into his son again and give him back to him. Now, Abraham's submission showed that he had a true and living faith, the kind of faith that actually justifies you. James writes in verses 21 through 23, was not Abraham our father justified by works? Now, he doesn't mean there, of course, that he was declared righteous before God because he did this thing. But what he means is that he has a faith that justifies, which was demonstrated by these works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar. You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. In other words, the fact that he did this meant he'd had the kind of faith that justifies. By the way, when it says, as a result of the works, faith was perfected, God gives faith for a specific purpose, a particular end. And that is that it would transform our lives and make us like our Lord Jesus Christ, make us willing to do whatever the Lord calls us to do and submit to him. Abraham had that kind of faith. And when he actually was willing to make this tremendous sacrifice, it showed that the faith that God had given to him had come to its perfection or to its end. This is the reason why God gave him the faith, was so that he would be willing to do this. And this is what faith will make us willing to do as well. Now, James is talking third about a love that is willing to put your own life on the line if that's what's necessary because of what God has said. And he uses the example of Rahab. Rahab received the Hebrew spies that came into her at Jericho. And when the soldiers came looking for them, she had hid them on the roof, but she told the soldiers they had gone out another way. Now, why did she do that? because she believed what God said was true. She had heard that God was going to give that land to his people, to the Jews, and he was going to destroy the inhabitants of the land of Jericho, and so she was willing to risk her own life by lying, even deceiving, to save these spies rather than hand them over. And by doing this, James says she gained her life. Verse 25, in the same way was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. Again, how do we know that Rahab really believed 
what God said. It's because of what she was willing to do. She acted on what she had heard God had said, even though she hadn't seen it yet. She believed, and faith will believe what God says and will act upon it because it trusts him. It trusts that what he is saying is true. And of course, there's that other element of love. I mean, a person might believe what God says is true, but, but not want to go that direction because they hate God. What's implied here as well is that she loved the Lord and wanted to be numbered with his people, not just that she wanted to save her skin. So there are these aspects to saving faith. This isn't a comprehensive description. There are other aspects, but I want you to notice that James points to those things which are visible, things which can be seen. Now, the promises of God, when he talks about the future, those things have to be apprehended by faith. You can't see those things, but if a person says he has faith, then you can see the difference in their lives. It makes a difference in the way they live. It produces works that can be seen by others. Look at verse 18. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. James is saying you can say you have faith, but if you have nothing to back it up, you really can't prove it. You can't show anyone you, because you don't have faith is what he's saying. But I will show you that I really do believe because it has made a difference in my life. I will show you my faith by my works. A living, saving faith produces works. It creates more than just nice feelings, feelings of sympathy. It, it reaches out to those who are in need. It does more than make us believe what God says is true. It makes us act on those beliefs, even to giving up what is most precious to us even our own lives, because we are sure that what God says he actually means. Saving faith is a working faith, a faith that works by love. If you have it, the Bible says it will transform your life. It will produce fruits. And that is exactly the reason why God sent his son into the world in the first place. It was not just to save us from the guilt of our sins, to save us from hell, but to save us from the power of sin so that we might love God and love our neighbor. After telling us in Ephesians chapter 2, <clears throat> the text we looked at last time, that salvation is by grace through faith alone and not by works so that no one can boast, Paul goes on to say this, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Now, is Paul telling us that, that works have nothing to do with our salvation? No, he's telling us that if we have truly believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, if we have saving faith, our lives will produce good works because that is why we've been created in Christ Jesus and recreated in him. This is the work God is doing in us to make us like him. Now, I hope you can, I hope you can see that you cannot be saved apart from works because works, as, as we've just seen, without works, the faith that we lay claim to is a dead faith and not a living faith, and only a living faith can save us. But we do want to make sure we're clear on the relationship between faith and works. We want to make sure we don't go into the one camp and add works back into salvation and destroy grace. We don't want to do that. And we certainly don't want to exclude works because James has just told us if we don't have works, we have a dead faith, and that dead faith can't save us. So how do we balance the two of those things together? Well, the answer is really simple. I think you know what it is. And yet there are so many who can hear this explanation again and again and again and still reject it and reject the idea of works must be there. They will say may, works may be there. If you want to do good works, you can. It's a good thing. But they don't have to be there. As a matter of fact, your life can be entirely unchanged and you can still go to heaven because you prayed some kind of a prayer at an altar, in a church, you answer an altar call. 
there are people who teach that. The college I went to teaches. They taught it when I was there. I'm not sure that anything's changed. Dallas Theological Seminary, at least for that time, was notorious for that, at least among circles that, that realized that that was wrong. It was very wrong. So how do we balance these two things together? Well, again, the answer is simple. The works that James is referring to here, the works that Paul is talking about here, that, that they say must accompany a true and saving faith, do not earn your salvation. They do not merit your salvation, your justification. They merely show that you have it. Another way of putting this is this, that though works are absolutely necessary, you cannot be saved apart from them, they do not earn heaven. They are not meritorious. Salvation is free. You can't buy it. Your works don't buy it. But your works show. They can show and they do show that you have the kind of faith that receives the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ so that you can enter into heaven. These works are the evidence. They are not the grounds. They are not the basis of your salvation. They are the fruits and the evidences of your salvation that must be there if you are saved. Again, notice what James says in verse 18. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Faith that justifies can be seen in the acts of love that it produces. Again, Paul says in Galatians 5, verse 6, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. You see, that which makes faith work is love. And love will cause you to do certain things. It will cause you to submit to God. It will cause you to reach out and to meet the needs of your brethren, your brothers and sisters. Now, James isn't saying that, well, let's see. James isn't telling us that it's enough to say that you love God and your neighbor. When the Lord cleanses your heart by grace, it transforms your life. When Jesus told the Pharisees that they were like whitewashed sepulchers and so forth, he said, clean out the inside of the cup and the outside will become clean as well. When the Lord enters into your life by his grace, it transforms your life so that you become more like him. It takes you beyond just, again, this well-wishing that James is referring to where you say, I love God but my life doesn't show that I love him because I'm not doing anything differently than anyone else. I'm not doing the things that God calls me to do. I'm not worshiping him the way I should be worshiping him. I'm not serving him the way I should be serving him. I may not be doing these things at all, and yet I say I love God. Well, do you really love him if you're not showing it by your actions or that you love your neighbor if you see your neighbor all around you and you see needs and yet you do nothing to meet those needs, James is telling us that a saving faith is going to go beyond just saying these things. Even the demons have a faith, but it's not this kind of faith. This kind of faith has to work itself out in your actions. You must really love God with your whole life and your neighbor as yourself. Again, James asked the question, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? The answer is no, it cannot save him because he says in verse 26, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Dead faith cannot save you. Only a living faith can save you, and a living faith produces works. So in closing, let me ask you these questions on, based on this text. Do you believe that you have savingly trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you believe that you are on your way to heaven by his grace? If that is true, then his love must be in your heart, and these works must be in your life. 
And the question that the Lord asks you this morning through this text is, are they? Are these works actually there? Now, all, if all you have is the belief that you're saved, but your life hasn't changed, what is James telling you? He's saying that your faith is dead. And so one day you are going to die, and you are going to die spiritually. You are going to be dead because you are dead unless you repent and believe. If these works aren't there, and by the way, James here, I just again, let's be careful here. He's not talking about perfection. He's not saying perfect works because none of us are going to be perfect this side of heaven. But if they are not there at all, if there is none of this fruit, if there is none of this desire and actual service of brothers and sisters, if there isn't this, this sacrifice and this trust in the Lord Jesus Christ that will allow you or move you to do things that require sacrifice, if that's not there, then you need to come to Jesus as he offers himself to you again in the gospel. The Lord says that if you trust him as your Savior and submit to him as your Lord, he will save you. And when he saves you, he will give you the ability to do what it is that he calls you to do, and that is to produce these works that end in a wholesale abandonment of one's life in this world to seek after life in the world to come. If you don't have that desire, then look to Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can put it there. But if he has given you this desire, remember again that these works can be greater or less depending upon how much of God's grace we have working in our hearts. If he has already given you this desire and you see these fruits in your life, don't ever be, be happy with what you see, but always strive for more. Seek the Lord to strengthen that grace in you through the means of grace so that you can do more for his glory. And by the way, when, when his grace is more operative in you and when you're doing more of the things the Lord calls you to do, it will also have another very beneficial side effect. As you see those things and you know that they come from a heart that loves the Lord, it will strengthen your assurance that you are the Lord's. If you don't see these works, it doesn't matter what you believe, you cannot really der derive assurance from that. You cannot claim to be the Lord, the Lord's according to what James says here. These works have to be there. And the more that they're there, the stronger it will convince you, testify to you, that you are a true son or daughter of God. So may he grant to each of us here this morning that we may be filled with his love and filled with these fruits of righteousness these acts of love and sacrifice and submission and whatever the Lord calls us to do, that we may prove ourselves to be true believers and not just those who deceive themselves. Well, may the Lord again grant us this mercy. Let's, um, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to apply his word to our hearts.